Um, but uh, Edgar, I'd like to turn things over to you now and uh, welcome to you to give your own introduction or to jump right into the demonstration. Yes, I'll introduce myself and then we'll go just very briefly. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Marco. Uh, thank you everybody for uh, coming here. And yes, my name is Edgar and I'm a certified court medical interpreter in, in California. I've taught in many universities and uh, I've also given talks. I'm going to actually be a presenter in this year's edition of NAJIT, the National Association of Judiciary Interpreters and Translators. And uh, that's what I do for a living. I, I train people. I don't do a lot of interpreting lately because, you know, it's hard to serve two masters. But uh, yeah, I, I try to do it once in a while. So that's me in a nutshell. I'm from Colombia. Okay, that's my that's where the country I come from. And well, thank, I want to thank Marco for inviting me. So today we're going to be talking about workers' compensation. Why did I choose this subject matter? Well, because usually when we work as freelance interpreters, which is the first thing that we do now, some people go straight to the courts. They become hired by the courts. That's what happened to me. I, I got hired uh, with the courts as soon as I got certified. But you, you know, I, once I stopped working for the courts, I started doing a lot of freelance work. And when you're a freelancer, one of the things that you're going to be doing the most, probably, and I'm sure of this, uh, is workers' compensation. What is workers' compensation? Well, somebody gets hurt, right? Uh, could be in any type of accident, but usually it, it's, uh, it's on the job and, you know, they break a leg or an arm or whatever that it is, and then they, they file, it, file a claim, right? And then this is where interpreters get involved. And at least here in California, that's a big market. And usually agencies, you know, hire interpreters to do this type of work. And it's probably going to be one of your first assignments. And when we go to interpreting school, if you want to call it, you know, I, I personally graduated from, I have a, a, a bachelor's in translation and interpretation from Long Beach, but I've also gone to trade schools. And when you go to trade school and all that, you, you see a little bit of everything. You don't really specialize in this. And this is something that you're going to be doing the most or at least initially. And, and again, you know, in school, there's no time to teach you a little bit of everything. So we're going to be look, seeing a form today, and I'm going to share it with you in just a minute. If, if you can help me, Mark, with the, the chat, you'll let me know if there's a question, right? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll handle the chat. Okay, thank you so much. So okay, anybody, so what, feel free to put questions in the chat, and we'll circle back around to them. Let me see if I can find what's going on here. Did I uh, do something wrong here? Let me see. Give me a second. I'm going to get my form up. Okay. Give me one sec. Oh, here it is. All righty. Okay. So now I, I do, I am aware that, so we have, when it comes to workers' compensation, there's federal laws, right? For example, for railroad, railroad workers, uh, if you have, for example, people that work out and see, there's, uh, there's these different types of uh, laws, let's just call them that, that cover the, the certain federal types, certain federal jobs, or there's federal laws that cover, cover certain type, types of occupations. Let's just say that. However, most of the workers' comp is handled by each state. Now, even though this form specifically is the one that we use in California, okay, you may have different forms if there's a settlement, for example. Once, and by the way, most cases, like in criminal courts, most cases are solved by a settlement. Okay. They don't actually go to trial. So if, if they do go to trial, well, it's a different process, but I would say, I don't, I don't have a number. I say, well, over half of the cases are settled and don't go to trial. So when there's a settlement, usually there's some forms that you sign and they're called settlement forms and they have different names in, in California. And we call them a compromise and release. And they may have different names in, in every state. Anyway, here's the deal. There's uh, in these forms, and no matter what state you're in, you're, you're going to share a lot of the vocab. Okay. I've, I've seen many forms and they, you know, there's a lot of words like a, a continuous trauma or a specific injury or a, an adjuster, right? And, you know, and, and I've seen a lot of people, for example, use the word ajustador. Ajustador es que ajusta los huesos, no? Entonces, you got to be careful. So it's, it's, and it's nothing wrong. It's just that we, we want to make sure that we, the, the profession, by the way, uh, we use certain terminology. Okay. 
And, you know, what we used 10 years ago, you know, we laugh at the term that we used, you know, a few years back. And now we use a term and we might be laughing at the term that we're using now if you use forward because the, 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 the profession is, you know, being developed and it's being improved. So, so let's talk about terminology. But first, the best way, okay, now I, we were speaking with uh, uh, Marco just a few minutes ago, and I was telling him that, you know, it's very difficult. I'm going to give you translations of certain terms. I'm going to be using uh, the Mexican terminology as my localization, not because I'm, like I said, I'm Colombian, but I'm going to use the Mexican localization. By localization, I mean, remember, we have over 20 countries that speak Spanish. Who are we speaking to? Who are we talking to? Who are we delivering the message to? Is there someone from Costa Rica or is it someone from Bolivia? And in the case of a Spanish speakers, right? And, and the same goes for all other countries. If you're Mandarin, what region? You know, India, it's a huge country. So you have to know where, who are you, who's your audience? So today I just want to give that, uh, uh, that announcement that it's, if I'm localizing most of the terminology to Mexico, number one. Number two, uh, and I think Marco has mentioned this in his talks, the, the, the translation that I give, okay, uh, there are many ways, there are many ways to skin a cat, right? So, uh, so why, you have to, you got to be careful. I always say in Spanish, mi traducción no es la última Coca-Cola del desierto. That means it's not, uh, I'm, I'm going to defend my translation. I'm going to tell you why I chose that translation, okay? And one of the things I wanted to teach all of you, well, show you, I'm sorry, is where do you, where do you find terminology? Like a dictionary? What dictionary do you recommend? Well, I actually don't recommend per se dictionary. Oh, yeah, there are some really good dictionaries. But what you want to do uh, in most of the cases, and let me just show you really quick. Uh, okay, there we go. Let me just show you really quick. Uh, okay. And we have to we have to get really quick. We got to get to the uh, ups. We got to get really quick to the uh, to the actual translation of the document. But before we do, if you notice what we have here, and this is one of the actually one of the first terms that we're going to probably learn today, is you see this name, Junta Federal de Conciliación y Arbitraje. Okay, so this in Mexico is the equivalent of what we call workers' compensation. This is workers' compensation. This is their equivalent. So how would you say workers' compensation? All right. Okay. Uh, uh, for example, here in California, we have a very specific name for a workers' compensation, which is the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board. Okay. That's what it's called. And why is it called Appeals Board? Well, it's crazy. We'll talk about that one in a minute, but it's called the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board. And in Mexico, it's called the Junta Federal de Conciliación y Arbitraje. So there we have our translation. Okay. So we don't have to go to a dictionary. We will go to a primary source. OK. All right. So just and then you can, you know, grab a lot of interesting uh, terminology from a website such as that. OK, now let's go back to the form. All right. So let's get started. This is uh, like I said, this is a form uh, that has nine pages when you interpret this form. OK, so we're, we're coming to an agreement. The, they're coming to an agreement with uh, the uh, the uh, insurance company and they they fill out this form. So what you have to do as an interpreter, at least here in California, for example, is you got to read this entire document, okay, from start to finish. So it's a site translation. So today I'm going to be doing a site translation of this document. However, because I know that this is more of a translation uh, website, right? We are going to do a translation of one section, which is the most difficult portion of this document. I consider it the most difficult we're going to actually see a translation. But because we don't have a lot of time, I'm going to be going through this document really quick. Now, usually it takes me about 20 minutes to do a, an entire site translation of this document. I've done this document many times. Um, but again, and many people have already done this document, and read it, for example, in California. Now, the question is, have you been using the correct terminology <laughs> or have we been using the correct terminology as we do a site translation? So let's start right now. Is everybody ready? Can I get some feedback? Yes, no? I'm reading yes, the chat. Yes, we're ready. We're ready. Okay, let's rock and yeah. roll then. Okay, very good. So let's start right here. The state of California is pretty easy. El estado de California. Division of workers, comp workers' compensation. Now, be careful with this one. 
Now, some people say compensación al trabajador. And really, when they're not, they're compensating them, yes. But there's a very specific term in Spanish, which is indemnizar, no? In división, a sección de indemnización laboral. So it's really the compensation part. You want to use that. And if you see many primary sources, you'll see that the, the uh, prevalent word is indemnizar. Now, if you use compensar, will people understand you? Of course they will. Will you get the message across? Of course you will. Now, remember, we, we always want to strive to use the best terminology possible. That's where it boils down to. Now, Workers' Compensation Appeals Board, how do we translate that? We just said, Junta de Conciliación y Arbitraje. That's it. Now, if you, if you look, for example, and I've, out of curiosity, of course, for example, I look in the Colombia, in Colombia's, uh, how do they handle it? They call it the same, una junta de conciliación arbitraje. So that, that term is pretty prevalent in many countries, Spanish-speaking countries. Now, here comes one that's very interesting, the compromise and release. So this is where I'm going to, I told uh, uh, Marco that I was going to be using a little bit of English and then translating this. Well, here it is. So compromise, when you, that's when you come to an agreement, right? And so, okay, you're going to give me $5,000. Great. And then for an exchange for you giving me that compensation, then I'm going to release you of any responsibility. In other words, we're done. I'm not going to sue you again. And I'm, I'm letting this uh, lawsuit go, right? This claim, right? And that's it. So that's what it is. It's an agreement. So this compromise and release is an agreement. It's, it's, it's a settlement, if you want to call it that. Now, this term, if you look in online, you'll see dozens of translations of this. You know? uh, but, and uh, I have a good friend, his name is Antonio Pelayo, and he's done actually a lot of studying on this. And, you know, and I agree with him. If you look in the codes, for example, in Mexico, that term, they only use one word for it. And this is one word, and this is, I know, a correct term. However, remember, you can use many terms. It's conciliación. You would say, what is conciliación? Settlement. Okay. It's the settlement. And this is what I call it. So co compromise and release is la conciliación. Some people say, well, couldn't you use, uh, I don't know, arreglo y liberación? Could I use um, uh, conciliación y liberación, right? Well, the problem is you, you can, okay? Not a problem. And if you, and there's actually a glossary. Uh, California has a glossary of workers' compensation terms. Uh, I do. I recommend you not trust that translation. Those translations. I've gone through those translations. There's a few little things that might, because of the definitions of the term, because the best way for you to translate a term is to look at the definition in English. What is? What does it mean? Okay, it's not. <clears throat> we're not translating words. We're translating concepts. So you don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want to just see words. Okay, I got to translate every single word. No, what does this mean? What is this equivalent to? Well, I already told you, if it's localized towards Mexico and to other several other countries, it's una conciliación, es un arreglo, verdad? Okay, very good. So we got this first part done, and then here we have num numbers, case number. Now, case is a very interesting word. There's two words that people use: causa y caso. Why should I use causa? Why should I use caso? What's the difference between the two? Well, causa, okay, is a more formal term. And this is, uh, well, that's, that's, that's the main reason. It's a more formal term. But there is something that when you're speaking before a judge, you should use the word causa. And when you're out of the presence of the judge, you, word, you use the word caso. Uh, I'm not going to go too deep into that, but I, my preference is causa because of the formality. So that's good. So that's easy, right? Causa numero uno, dos, tres, cuatro. Numero de seguro social. Here we come to a very interesting word, seguro. Remember, a lot of people, and this has happened to me in court numerous times, you say, you know, uh, you, so they're, 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 looking, they're looking at the judge, right? And they tell the judge, um, did you bring your insurance? Trajo su seguro. And they say, no, no tengo. Okay, no, I don't have any. But you, I thought you told me you had car insurance. Pero usted dijo que tenía seguro de auto. Ah, aseguranza de auto, si tengo. No tengo el seguro social, right? So <laughs> the question comes, should we use aseguranza so they can understand or no? We use seguro 
And people, it's probably going to become a word in the Real Academia because so many people use it. But it's remember, it's seguro is this one, right? Okay. Uh, okay. So I'm going to start interpreting really quick. Okay. And, and then I'm going to pause after I do a section to just uh, make uh, some comments on certain terminology. So, okay. El lugar que usted elija se basa. Okay. No, notice it. El lugar que usted elija se basa. Se basa en que. Okay. Number one. Remember, when we do translations, active, passive. Very important that you take that into consideration. In English or in legal terminology, it, the, the preference is to use the passive. For example, the police were called to the scene. La policía fue llamada al lugar. Or some people say a la escena, right? That is incorrect because English prefers the passive. La policía fue llamada. No, se llamó a la policía al lugar o a la escena. When we do formal translations, we want to always use the active. So if you notice here, el lugar que se eligió se fue, fue basado, that's passive. Se basó, el lugar, okay? El lugar que eligió se basó en qué? What it, was it based on? Okay, se debe completar este, esta sección. Se, se requiere, se requiere que se complete esta sección. Se requiere. No, es, eh, se, se, es requerida, no. That's passive. Se requiere. All right. Se requiere que se complete esta sección. Okay, so county, la condado de residencia del empleado, conforme al código laboral, artículo, no sección, artículo número 55.5, inciso A1 o D. Okay, inciso. Okay, section, subsection, inciso. Sub, subsection, subinciso. Okay, aquí tenemos inciso A1, A, D. Condado donde ocurrió la lesión, conforme al código laboral, artículo ta, 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 right? Eh, condado, eh, entonces, el condado que es el principal lugar de residencia del abogado del empleado, ¿no? Entonces, lo mismo que acá arriba. Ok, vamos para todos. Ya, la, ok, select three letter office. Now, aquí dice que, se, porque este es de específico de California, uno elige, por ejemplo, si es uh, Bakersfield, right? Entonces, se, seleccione eh, las tres letras del código de la oficina para el lugar o el venue, but it so happens that venue is also a place in Spanish, right? Because it's the same thing, right? Entonces, aquí cuando ocurre esto, entonces ahí usamos, hay un libro que tengo yo aquí, se los voy a recomendar. Permítame en un segundo, no, lo, no me acordé. There's a lot of good books online. Okay, a lot of a lot of free places, but in legal terminology, constantly you're going to be running into synonyms. You have to know a lot of synonyms because they use now sometimes I say dupletas, tripletas. We can use one word to replace two synonyms because it's they use, but there's a reason why attorneys use many synonyms to describe one thing. They want to make their whatever they they're saying airtight. Because somebody might say, well, you said this word, but this word doesn't, you know, encompass all the things that, you know, that have to be said. So that's why they use a lot of synonyms. <clears throat> There's a book. And it's all a synonyms book. It's one of the best that I've, I've ever seen. It's called Corripios, Fernando Corri Corripio, no? Diccionario de Ideas Afines, which is really good if you're a Spanish speaker. I'll, I'll send the name to, uh, <clears throat> to Marco later on. Okay, so, empleado. Complete esta sección, se requiere nombre, apellido, domicilio, apartado postal. Por favor, dejen blanco estos espacios. Por favor, dejen blanco espacios entre los nombres, los nombres o las palabras. La ciudad, el estado, el código postal. Employer information, información del patrono. La gente dice, ¿cómo así que del patrono? ¿No se puede decir empleador? Sí, se puede, pero el término más, the term that is more... <clears throat> Sorry. The term that is more uh, high register would be patrono. I, although my, you, you might think, oh, it doesn't seem very high register, but it is. If you look at some codes, you'll notice that that word is used uh, frequently. Asegurado. Okay. Asegurado por cuenta propia. No. 
si you, if you, alguien dice, ¿puede decirse de otra manera? Claro que sí. You know, you could say it other ways. Uh, no, no, asegura, no asegurado de manera legal. Now, when they say legally, you can say legalmente o de manera legal. Those are the two ways to replace the L-Y. No asegurado de manera legal. What does this mean? Well, sometimes uh, there's... Sometimes they're not required to insure employees, it, it, depending on the number of employees. There's some rules to that, and that might change from state to state. But in essence, that's what it means. Oh, simply no asegurado. Nombre del empleado, por favor. We already interpreted this. So I translate that. Domicilio, portado postal, ciudad, well, we, go, we took care of that. This right here, Wayne's Department of Workers' Compensation, right? From California, and then the name of the four, revised, you know? Entonces, Departamento de Indemnización Laboral de California, formulario 10214C, aquí si no es inciso C, sino C, revisado el 11 de noviembre de 2018, página 1 de 9, perfecto. Ok, now here we come to a very interesting term, applicant. So, right, we have, now remember, we have different, depending on where we are, if we're in criminal court, right, if the defendant is el acusado, And in civil court, defendant is el demandado. And if we have, for example, if we're in family law, okay, it's a little bit, también es el demandado, but we, we, with the app, we have a different names for the applicants and the defendants. Here is el reclamante y el reclamado. ¿Por qué? Porque presentan un reclamo. They file a claim. Okay, when you file a claim, es un reclamo. Uh, tenemos el reclamo que nos dan nuestras esposas cuando llegamos tarde, pues es otro reclamo, ¿verdad? Pero este, este reclamo es el reclamo, el reclamado y el reclamante. Entonces, el abogado reclamante o el representante autorizado, el bufete, el bufete jurídico, right También se puede decir el despacho jurídico, el bufete jurídico, hay otros nombres, cualquiera de esos está bien. Uh, o un, un representante que no es un abogado, nombre, apellido. Número de la, del bufete jurídico, nombre de la empresa, ¿no? Marco Hidalgo, Marco Edgar and Associates, right? Que ahí va por ahí. Al domicilio, la portada postal, la ciudad. Por aquí estamos fácil, ¿no? Todo lo mismo. Y a veces hay más de un abogado. Ustedes dirán, ¿por, ¿por qué más de un abogado? Why more than one attorney? Because maybe you were working in one company and then they changed, they sold the company to another and then the, the, you have another attorney. So they might, there might be more than one attorney involved. There, Many examples of why there could be more than one attorney. So that's repeated. Okay. Very important right here. Insurance carrier. Please do not use the word compañía. Do not use compañía. Let me tell you why compañía is, is an incorrect. We, I see it in translations everywhere. Do not use compañía because compañía, okay, means something completely different. For example, um, Marco Hansen. S.A., Sociedad Anónima. That's a corporation, right? I'm sorry, Marco, I'm picking on you. <laughs> All right, so uh, Marco Hansen, uh, Sociedad Anónima, S.A., no es Suramérica. Eh? Marco Hansen, Sociedad Anónima. That's a corporation, okay? Eso es una compañía, porque eh, hay una sociedad de personas. No todas las empresas son sociedades. No es necesariamente. Es, a eso se refiere, pero, lo, pero una, uh, when you're talking just about a company, okay, any type of company, es una empresa, es una empresa. Ahora, pueda que esa empresa, may, maybe that company is incorporated, maybe it is. I, see, I'm not incorporated, you know, some of you just are sole proprietorship, y tienen una empresa. You have a company, but it's not an LLC or that, so be careful when you say, Ustedes pueden decir una, una agencia de seguros, por ejemplo, una agencia, una empresa incluso de seguros, pero Compañía de seguros, si es una sociedad no, so you gotta be, this is gotta be a little bit careful there, okay? Uh, información de la agencia de seguros, si se conoce, okay? Si se sabe, ¿no? Si se sabe y si procede, no si es aplicable, se puede aplicar uno la crema, ¿no? El vaporú. Does this apply? Procede, okay? Ahora, la gente dice, bueno, aplica, a, estoy aplicando a un trabajo, I'm applying for a job. Sí se puede, sí se puede, pero hay, el término más, eh, más formal es, eh, it does not apply, no procede, ¿ok? Incluso, aún si la aseguradora, ¿ok? 
is adjusted by a claims administrator. Now, here we come to the word, one of the words that is adjusted. And I'm actually going to give all of you guys a, um, a glossary. And I'll show you what the glossary with all these terms, okay? So adjusted, donde, okay, esta es muy importante. Entonces, ya les dije, I already told you that ajustar, se ajustan los huesos, ¿no? Uh, if you, for example, say una, an adjuster is basically a person that determines what the um, the amount is to, to pay, right? Entonces, for example, puede ser un evaluador de reclamos. So he evaluates the claim. O tengo aquí también, eh, también lo he encontrado en, otros, en otras uh, empresas, evaluador de siniestros laborales. Un siniestro, pues es un accidente, un choque puede ser, ¿no? Uh, hay siniestros automovilísticos, siniestros laborales. So that's an adjuster. But to adjust as a verb, okay, to adjust as a verb es determinar el presupuesto a indemnizar. So, incluso aún si la aseguradora debe ajustar el presupuesto a indemnizar, okay, por parte del el ajuste, aquí no, no es ajustador, ¿no? O sea, aquí, de, entonces aquí tenemos eh, de parte de el, um, del evaluador de siniestros, podemos decir, ¿no? So, incluso aún si la aseguradora, ¿ok? Debe determinar el valor a indemnizar por parte del administrador de siniestros. Y ya. Ok. Entonces, el nombre de la, de la aseguradora, por favor, la, el nombre, el domicilio, la calle, lo mismo acá. Ok. Ok, aquí ya venimos con las tripas de la, de la, uh, de la, pues de la traducción, ¿verdad? Pero aún no lo vamos a hacer esto, no es la parte difícil. Ok, muy bien. Vamos a ver qué tenemos aquí. Ok, entonces. Um, ok, very good. Uh, pa, 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 pa. Ok, muy bien. Ok, se, 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 se alega, ¿no? Se alega. O se... Um, the word would be here because claim es una demanda, ¿no? Pero aquí no se dice se demanda. Simplemente se, se, se alega, se dice, ¿no? Eh, se, um, se declara que el empleado lastimado nacido tal, que nació tal fecha. Ok. Um, Declara que mientras estaba empleado en tal lugar, sostuvo una lesión que arising and of que se suscitó, o sea, durante y en el transcurso de su empleo en tales lugares y durante en, en es, estos lugares y durante las fechas que se enumeran a continuación. List es enumerar, ¿no? Dicen, pero si no hay números o a veces sí hay números, a veces no hay, a veces, sometimes you have bullet points. Entonces, so it's enumerar, en below no se dice abajo, sino a continuación. Okay. Declare la, con, con, de manera específica las fechas de las lesiones y qué partes del cuerpo, qué afecciones, okay. no se dice condiciones, sino afecciones o sistemas corporales se están, eh, se están uh, llegando, se están um, conciliando, se puede... Se, o, o se están o se, se van a van a llegar a una conciliación con respecto a estas partes, ¿no? Ok, muy bien. Entonces, el número de la causa. Aquí tenemos dos términos muy específicos, ¿no? Lesión de instancia única. Why? ¿Por qué no lesión específica? Porque no, no se trata, cuando se dice de specific injury, it's because it happened on a certain date. Ok, on a very specific date, like, Monday, August 3rd, or whatever, at 3 o'clock. Entonces, es una lesión que pasó en un momento específico, una lesión de instancia única. Cumulative injury es una lesión que ocurrió en, en el transcurso de, del tiempo. No ocurrió. It's just what we call, a, another synonym for cumulative injury is repetitive injury. O sea, que ocurrió varias veces. No, varias veces. Entonces, no es una lesión que se acumula. No, you can't get one and then accumulate it with the other. No, es una lesión que ocurrió a lo largo del tiempo. Entonces, es una lesión 
eh, de no, esta distancia única o una lesión que ocurrió a, a lo largo del tiempo. Creo que acá les tengo otra definición. Eh, de distancia indefinida o lesión por movimientos repetitivos. Lo mismo, ¿no? Ok. Muy bien. Entonces, la fecha de inicio, la fecha que culminó. Eh, si es una lesión eh, de instancia única, use la fecha de inicio como la fecha específica. O sea, si es instancia única, pues pon, aquí la fecha que aparece sería eh, la fecha que se dio, right? Then, tenemos las partes del cuerpo. Now, here is where you, all your medical terminology has to come in. They'll give you all the body parts, right? And then the address where it occurred. Okay. Then we have something here. It says the body parts, condition, and systems may not be incorporated by reference to the medical reports. Las partes del, cuer las partes cor del cuerpo corporales, las afecciones o los sistemas corporales no se incorporarán, okay? Por referencia. What does this mean? Okay, what does it mean in los informes médicos? Incorporated, incorporated by... Okay, so basically... Uh, la traducción pues se incluyen por referencia, but what does it mean? What is to incorporate by reference? Because again, by understanding, you can use any type of terminology. It's basically, the, so the, if you look in the definition to incorporate by reference, it means to integrate language from one document into another document. It's basically what it is. So basically, uh, that's why they're saying, you know, you're writing them down here because these may not be incorporated from the other documents that we have, okay? Or to the medical reports. That's what they mean. But the, the, trans, the translation is pretty easy. Incorporar por referencia, but that's what it means, okay? All right. Then we have more because we can have many body parts depending, we can have many case numbers. So we're going to sc scroll through all of these, okay? And it's basically the same. All right. Now, aquí llegamos al chorizo, <laughs> This is where the mess begins, okay? This is where it gets really hairy, but it's, do not despair, okay? Do not despair. We will go analyze this one really easy. We're going to get to that one. This will be the main dish. We'll get to this one. We're going to skip it for now, okay? Because we're going to do that at the end. So this is where the whole, you know, the, what they tell you, this is the deal, okay? You're not going to sue us. You're not going to do this. You're going to do that. This is where, like, the whole thing comes in. This is the part that you, they really, the other part, you know, they don't care the, where the address of the insurance company is. Who, you know, all that stuff is, yeah, it's important. Maybe the, how they got injured and what body parts, that's super important. You do want to dedicate, you know, because they usually say, well, and I didn't hurt that part, and they forgot to put this, and they forgot to put that. That's where you're going to get all those arguments. But But, you know, that's important. But the names of, of the attorneys and all that, that's not really of importance to um, the person that files a claim. Okay, so I'm going to jump to this page and then we'll go to the other one. Okay, so the, because this is also important, the part, las partes están de acuerdo en llegar a un arreglo para la demanda o el reclamo anterior, okay, con respecto a las lesiones por el pago en la suma de tanto. Here's where they give them like $20,000, right? Uh, las siguientes cantidades se van a deducir del arreglo, del monto del arreglo, ¿no? O de la, de, sí, it, the settlement is basically de la conciliación, del arreglo. Pueden usar muchas palabras. Okay, here's where we have, so this is what, and usually this is where they deduce certain, ¿no? Uh, adelantos por incapacidad permanente hasta la fecha tal, ¿no? Here's an important word. Disability, no es discapacidad, es incapacidad. Be very careful with that. There's a big difference between discapacidad and incapacidad. When you, when you get hurt in workers' comp, it's usually, it lasts for, let's say you hurt your uh, thumb. You usually recover after a year or whatever. So it's, it's, trans, it's, it's, it's not permanent. So since it's not permanent, well, a disability in Spanish, not discapacidad, if you were born blind, Okay, that's, you're disabled for life. There you're disabled for life. Ahí sí está uno discapacitado de por vida. Pero las, las lesiones de workers' comp, the workers' comp injuries are incapacidades. Por eso, para, uh, uh, por adelanto de incapacidad permanente hasta tal fecha, por indemnización por in, incapacidad temporal, por sobrepago, ¿no? Sobrepago 
eh, de indemnización por incapacidad temporal, si es que hubo, eh, tal que se, que se paga a tal persona, this is, you know, whatever, interpreters, court reporters, whatever. Ok. Y obviamente eh, lo que se solicita el abogado en honor, honorarios, ¿no? Lo que es, the fees son los honorarios, ¿no? Requested as applicant's attorney's fee, lo que solicitó el abogado con respecto a los honorarios, por sus honorarios, dejando un, un saldo de tanto después de, de deducir las cantidades. Oh, now here's a word that's interesting. I'm, when I give you the glossary, I'm going to give you all the, you know, here in, here after, set forth, blah, blah, blah. all these little words are very important, very important. So, for example, uh, set forth is basically described. Okay, that's it. <laughs> so, after, después, después de deducir las cantidades descritas anteriormente, no arriba, no? Anteriormente. Y eh, restando los adelantos de incapacidad permanente, ¿no? Que se hicieron después de la fecha anterior. Con, uh, los intereses conforme al Código Laboral, artículo 5800, se incluyen en, la su, en, la, en las sumas descritas aquí. Ok, here in, aquí, que también las tengo, creo que lo tengo aquí también. Aquí o aquí adentro. Aquí. Uh, sí, uh, uh, The sum set forth here in, las, 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 las sumas que se colocan aquí, eh, si se colo pagan a los, uh, si se pagan a los 30 días después de la fecha de aprobación de este acuerdo. Basically, if, if they pay within 30 days of this settlement, they don't have to pay additional uh, fees, right? Multas o penalidades, ¿no? Liens yes, are not mentioned in paragraph 7, ¿no? Question. Now, this is a very, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. There's just a question in the chat. Can you explain um, overpayment at the top of the screen here? What an overpayment would be? An, an overpayment is if, if they pay in excess of what they were. Because sometimes they give them some money. Uh, I don't know. They're, they're getting money. But let's say that the uh, they're, they're paying them, I don't know, $300 a, a week, whatever, right? For a, a certain period of time. But, but the... Uh, But the agreement was only for $5,000. So there's overpayment, sobrepago, okay? So that, I, and, they, and they could come from many, I'm just giving this example right off the top. There could be many instances where they can get paid in excess, okay? And so after de deducing the amount set forth and less permanent disability advances made after the date set forth, interest, let me see, donde está el sobrepago? Where, where, did, where did I, I'm trying to look for that. Is it here? Yeah, it's just at the top of the, the the screen. Okay. Where? Well, I'm talking about the word overpayment. I can't find it. I lost it. Um, the second second, line, second item. Oh, second here it is. Dollar sign. Okay, temporary. Yeah, that's what it is. So for temporary disability indemnity overpayment. See, so if they're paying disability, because remember, before they get the settlement, sometimes it's the state give them disability payments. So they they get them for a certain period of time. But what, like I said, when, when the case closes, if they've been paid, let's say $7,000 and they're, uh, you know, they're only supposed to get paid $5,000, there, there's an overpayment. So what they do is they deduce that amount from the total claim, okay? Whatever that claim may be. That's what they mean, okay. Liens, okay, liens. Now, there's a, there's, there is a, a, a legal term for lien. When I do this translation, okay, site translation, I, um, I, I, don't, I don't use this, this term very often, although this is a term that you should be using. And I just lower the register just a little bit. Uh, es un gravamen. So I say, this is what the term that I use. Cuentas por pagar. Okay, because that's what it is. It's... Liens are things that have to be paid out of the settlement. That's what it is. Un gravamen. Son cuentas que por pagar. Las cuentas. So uh, los gravamen. If, but you know, you obviously you can say gravamen. And if the attorney is there, then he should answer the question. Now, many times the attorney just throw us this and leave. They just say read the whole thing. So a gravamen is basically things that have that have to be paid. Services that have to be paid after the settlement is given. 
So, liens son cuentas por pagar, gravámenes, que no se mencionan en el párrafo 7. Se deben, to be disposed, se deben cuadrar, se deben arreglar de la siguiente manera, ¿ok? Y entonces, agregar un adendo si se hace necesario. ¿Qué es un adendo? Es uh, hojas agregadas. Be careful, because in a book, ¿ok? It's called un apéndice. But this is not a book. This is a legal. So, in legal, we use adendo, which is sheets that they add to whatever these nine sheets that we're seeing right here. Okay, very good. Now, let's see, we have to leave at least 15 minutes for the big one. Okay, the parties, las, las partes desean llegar a un arreglo con respecto a estos asuntos para evitar los costos, los riesgos y los retrasos de un litigio futuro. Y están de acuerdo que existe una disputa seria, grave, con respecto a los siguientes asuntos. Coloque sus iniciales solo a, a aquellos que procedan. Solo aquellos asuntos que tengan las iniciales por parte del reclamante o su representante o, o los de, o, y, o su representante y los reclamados y sus representantes se incluyen dentro de este arreglo, ¿no? Donde esta conciliación le pueden llamar. Entonces aquí todo van a colocarles las, entonces ganancias, incapacidad temporal, el fuero, o sea, el, la competencia, jurisdiction, pues puede decir jurisdicción. Esta es una palabra interesantísima que necesito dedicarle unos minutos. Apportionment es, es un término complicado. Eh, en, en algunas partes en internet he visto yo la palabra prorrateo. Pero it basically means that if you get hurt, right, at your job, you probably, let's say you broke, you injured your knee, They have to give you some money. But what they say, look at, uh, look at your age. Maybe you have arthritis. Maybe you had an accident in the past with your knee. So they're not responsible 100% for that knee. Uh, maybe the accident just, you know, it hurt. It, it, they're only responsible for 30% of the damage instead of 100%. So that is called what they call the apportionment. Okay. And, and the translation is el, el porcentaje de responsabilidad del patrono. So the percentage of responsibility of the employer, that's what it is. That's the, that's the definition of what apportionment is. So remember, we don't translate the word, we translate the concept. So it's a percentage of responsibility that corresponds to the employer. Porcentaje de responsabilidad del patrono. That's the translation for apportionment. Empleado. Empleo, perdón. Uh, uh, these AOE, basic, this can be in... You can see it in different ways. Uh, arising out of employment would be the, the initials, right? Or course of employment. O sea, que esto es que surge o ocurre en el transcurso del empleo. Okay? Conducta. Mala conducta grave e intencional por parte del empleador, ¿no? Esto, o sea, lo que están diciendo aquí, this is all you're releasing us on. Once we give you the money, we're off the hook for any of these things that you initial. So if we had any serious or willful muscanga, mala conducta contigo, we're off the hook. If we had discrimination, discriminación conforme al código laboral, artículo 132, inciso A. Okay. Artículo, section, right? This section, artículo 132. Statute of, limit, of limitations is basically la ley de prescripción, which basically is eh, el plazo reglamentario que tienen para entablar una demanda. I, I actually use that term, el plazo reglamentario. Why? Because that's what it is. But there is a term, que es la, la, la ley de prescripción, que determina los plazos reglamentarios para poder entrar demandas. That's it. Cuidado médico futuro, otros, incapacidad permanente. Mire que seguimos con la palabra incapacidad permanente. Tratamiento médico que hayan, que hayan buscado por su cuenta, salvo lo dispuesto en el párrafo 7. Aquí hay una muy interesante y esto puede cambiar de, de, estado, de estado a estado, which is basically when someone gets hurt, in order for them to continue working, they give them like a voucher, un vale, uh, so they can study, I don't know, photography, some other type of, um, of, um, of job. So that way they can get, um, you know, get another job. So this is called Vocational Rehabilitation Benefit, Supplemental Job Displacement Benefit. Now, you can translate this word for word, but the concept, and, and again, in the, in the glossary that I gave you, okay, the glossary is, aquí le puse, you know, you, um, básicamente es 
eh, el vale educativo para eh, volver a, a aprender otra profesión, if you want to say it. I can't remember. Oh, let me see if I have it here. Uh, let me see vocational. If I, if I, oh, here it is, right here. Basically, le puse beca estatal para sufragar el costo de capacitación. It doesn't really matter how you word it, if you understand the concept. Okay? So you press, now, when you see the word benefit, be careful with using the word beneficios. Sometimes it is beneficio, sometimes es una prestación. Okay? Por ejemplo, a mí me dan el beneficio en el trabajo de tomarme los viernes libres. I have the benefit at work of taking Fridays off, right? Four day, four day week. Eso es un beneficio, no una prestación. Prestación normalmente viene del gobierno, like uh, when, uh, la jubilación, right? Retirement is, is, is a, that's a, es una prestación, no un beneficio. I, I consider beneficio more like a perk. But anyway, aquí sí es un beneficio. Es un beneficio de, de, de educativo. Basically, they train you, okay? And so you may want to interpret that in a different way. Okay. Let me read this part right here for you. Uh, Se está de acuerdo que las partes aquí presentes, uh, que el, esta diligencia, el, el diligenciar este documento, es el diligenciar una solicitud y que el juez administrativo de indemnización laboral puede, a su discreción, fijar el asunto como una audiencia de, de solicitud normal, regular. Eh, ahorita les explico qué es eso. Reservando a las partes del derecho de poner en tela de juicio cual, todos, los, todos los hechos, when you see the word any, es todo, not always, but most of the time, todos los hechos que se admitan aquí. Y que si la audiencia se, se celebra con este documento que se utilice como una solicitud, los reclamados tendrán a su disposición todas las defensas que estuviesen disponibles en la fecha de diligenciar este documento y que el juez administrativo de indemnización laboral puede de aquí en, eh, puede después de esto ya sea aprobar esta conciliación o no aprobarla y hallar ok, this one's a findings and award, now here we want to hear the, the definition ok, básicamente es el fallo del juez the findings and award basically is when he um, It's, it's his determination to give some type of award. So he, he, he rules on the case. And then after ruling, usually in, in favor of the, of the claimant, right? It's, and then he files the award, right? And then, so that basically that's what it is. So entonces tenemos que fallo del juez que concede la indemnización, okay? Y emite el fallo que concede en la indemnización después de la audiencia después de que se haya celebrado la audiencia y que el caso ok, se haya presentado para su decisión ok, muy bien, let's continue here, now here comes, this is actually the last page and then we're going to go to the other one, the other one don't worry because I have it printed out for you so if we don't finish, it's ok uh, we still have some time here ok, here's a word ok, which is warning if you, si ustedes ponen advertencia um, You got to be careful with that. Have you ever seen when they play soccer, que no le llaman, cuando les dan una tarjeta amarilla, una tarjeta roja, no les dan una, una, no les dan una advertencia? Les dan una amonestación. So the, if you look at the word amonestación a Real Academia, you'll see that it's a kind of advertencia. Amonestación para el, para el empleado. El llegar a una, un arreglo, ¿no? Eh, de, el, de, la dema, de una demanda, un reclamo de, de inencia, indemnización laboral por parte de una conciliación puede afectar otras prestaciones que está recibiendo o que tiene derecho a recibir en el futuro de otras fuentes aparte de lo que es indemnización laboral que incluye pero no, no, pero no se limita al seguro social, Medicare y a las prestaciones de incapacidad a largo plazo el reclamante okay, la firma del reclamante o del empleado debe ser uh, cert, no certificada autenticada, perdón por dos personas que no estén no que no estén eh, no sean partes no interesadas no en el caso o lo, lo debe eh, o se o debe ser eh, autenticado me quiere que lo mismo no autenticado ante un notario okay. al firmar este acuerdo el reclamante el empleado eh, 
reconoce que él, ok, ha leí, leyó y entiende el acuerdo y que tiene, y que, y que todas las preguntas que él pueda, haya podido tener con respecto a este acuerdo se le, se le respondieron a su plena satisfacción, ¿no? Bueno, aquí tenemos esto. Tenemos al final esto y lo voy a leer rapidito para que alcancemos a hacer. Do we, do we have another 10 minutes, uh, Mark? Yeah, that's fine with me. If, um, if, if anybody needs to sign off early, they can, but let's keep going. Ok. Bueno, eh, cuando, cuando se firma este documento, este acuse de recibo, eh, eh, bueno, esta es, no es, es una autenticación, Bert, en realidad. Se autentican las firmas. La autentica, eso no es acuse de recibo, porque esto no es para decir acknowledgement usually is that you receive the document and you acknowledge that you received it. This is not this. Que esa sería la traducción, sería acuse de recibo. Este es una autenticación. ¿De qué? De firmas. So, entonces, esta se las voy a leer rapidito. ¿Ok? Uh, pero, um, vamos a ver. Está de California, condado de, digamos, San Bernardino, el 3 de abril de 2022. No, eh, fulano, miren que aquí está bien complicado. Esto está aquí. Hay una, ok, on this date before me, so and so personally appeared before me. This is the name of the notary. So on so, so let's let's organize it in our mind and then we'll we'll, we'll translate. Okay, so on this date before me, I'm this, I'm the uh, the um, the, what do you call it? The uh, notary personally appeared the party who proved to, uh, to me on the basis of the evidence. Okay. And then we have the rest. So, el, digamos, el 4 de abril 2022 compareció fulano de tal. I'm moving things around. Okay. First, I'm giving, compareció fulano de tal. En persona, ante mí, Juan Pérez, digamos que yo me llamo Juan Pérez. Eh, y, y con pruebas satisfactorias. I want you to follow me now. Okay. Here we go. Y con pruebas satisfactorias me demostró ser la persona cuyo nombre aparece en el documento y admite que él firmó el mismo en su calidad de autorizado. Y que al firmar dicho documento, la persona o la identidad la cual representa formalizan dicho documento. So, formalizar es execute, right? Formalizan dicho instrumento. Formalizar es que pues se firmó. Uno puede decir firmar o formalizar. Doy fe bajo pena de falso testimonio o pena de perjurio, hay muchas maneras de decirlo, y bajo las leyes del de, estado de California que el párrafo anterior es fiel y correcto, doy fe con mi firma y sello oficial, o estampo mi firma y sello, ¿no? Esto es en caso de que se necesite un notario y no tengamos testigos. Bueno, ahora sí vamos con el plato fuerte. Entonces lo que vamos a hacer aquí es algo un poco distinto. Les voy a yo, yo esta traducción se las voy a dar yo, o sea que les voy a dar un glosario I'm going to give you some good things Okay, so what I did here already, because I kind of knew that we're going to run out of time, uh, is I got every, that little page, I actually, I'm going to give you a translation of it. Now, there's several ways you can go with this translation. So uh, uh, this is why, I'm, at least let's look at one or two paragraphs so you can understand, so you understand what I'm giving you, because I'm giving you like a few versions of it. Okay, so let's go little by little here, Okay. Tras la aprobación o tras el visto bueno de este acuerdo mutuo por parte de la Junta de Conciliación y Arbitraje o un juez de derecho administrativo de iniciación laboral, ¿ok? Y después, ¿ok? Uh, and here we go. Uh, ¿Ok? Y después de hacerse el pago según las disposiciones del presente, ¿ok? Let me see if, where, where are we? And payment, and payment in accordance to the provision there hereof. Y, y después de hacerse el pago, según las disposiciones del presente, el empleado o el obrero, ojo, libera y descarga. Mire que aquí puse libera y descarga. Ok. Aquí estamos, ok, for which is beta, ta, 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 claims and cause, releases, employee releases and forever discharges. Ok. Libera y descarga. Pueden ser. Eh, y aquí le puse por siempre, ¿no? Exime y exonera. Hay más palabras que pueden usar. Por siempre al patrono, ¿ok? The employer, ¿ok? Uh, but employer and insurance carriers from all claims and causes of, of action. 
al patrón mencionados anteriormente y a la aseguradora de todos los reclamos y causales de demanda. Hasta ahí vamos, ¿no? Ok. Whether known or ascertained or which may hereafter arise or develop as a result of the above mentioned injury. Let's stop. Let's go right here. Um, vamos pues. Ya sea que se conozcan o se puedan establecer o que puedan surgir o desarrollarse de aquí en adelante como resultado de las lesiones mencionadas anteriormente. Muy bien. Seguimos con la siguiente parte. Ok. Which are, is this one right here. Including any and all liability. Esto incluye toda responsabilidad. Ok. Mire que any. No, no tratemos de no decir cualquiera. Every time you see any es toda. Okay. Esto incluye toda responsabilidad que el patrono y la aseguradora tengan con la prole. Esta palabra prole es the high register of saying dependiente. Se puede usar la palabra los dependientes, pero van a ver muchas veces la palabra la prole. ¿no? La prole. Y no es mala palabra, no es una, it's not, uh, you know, no es una palabra que para decir que algo es, uh, you know, porque uno escucha el proletariado, ¿no? Pero no. Los herederos, then we have uh, heirs, executors, albaceas, representantes, administradores o sesionarios, assigned, sesionarios del empleado. Veamos la última parte. Execution of this form. El cumplimiento de este formulario no tiene ningún efecto en aquellos reclamos que no ampare la ley, not in scope of the workers' compensation law, de indemnización laboral, o los reclamos que no estén sujetos a las disposiciones de exclusividad de la ley de indemnización laboral, salvo que se declare expresamente lo contrario. Esta palabra expresamente puede ser claramente, explícitamente, ¿no? Muy bien. Voy a saltarme, porque les voy a dejar esto aquí, ¿ok? A este párrafo que está acá abajo. Y con esto terminamos. Ok, salvo que se declare expresamente, claramente, explícitamente lo contrario, la aprobación de este acuerdo, o se podría decir el otorgar el visto bueno a esta conciliación, lo mismo, libera de toda demanda que tengan los dependientes del reclamante, descarga toda y cada una de las pretensiones que la prole del reclamante pudiera tener. Aquí vemos dos traducciones de lo mismo, una con prole, una con dependientes, una con pretensiones y otra con demanda, ok. Toda demanda o cada una de las pretensiones. Miren que es lo mismo. ¿no? Es the claim. Con respecto a las pre prestaciones por muertes ligadas o, o, o u ocasionadas por la lesión o las lesiones de, descritas por esta conciliación. Las partes han considerado, las partes han sopesado el descargo de dichas prestaciones al llevar la suma en el párrafo número 7. Todo documento anexo que duplique any addendum Mire que aquí le, no le puse adendo, sino le puse documento anexo, que es lo mismo. ¿Ok? Cualquier documento anexo que duplique este lenguaje conforme a la causa. Y aquí viene una parte muy interesante. ¿Cómo diablos leemos esto? Ahorita vamos a ver. Conforme a la causa Sumner, aquí dice. Sumner versus la Junta de Conciliación de Arbitraje, que eh, del año 1983, volumen. Okay. Volumen 48 de, los, de las causas de indemnización laboral de California. Sí, 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 es California Campus Inc. Okay. Página 369. Es necesario y no se anexará. Entonces, la pregunta es, el acusado, eh, o el, perdón, el demandante o el reclamante, ¿necesita saber todo eso? Bueno, y... Eh, Pasa muchas veces que no sabemos qué significa todo ese chorizo ahí, ¿no? Hay, hay, unas, um, hay, hay unas hojas que ustedes pueden encontrar en línea que les enseñan cómo leer esos números. Yo, es más, yo cuando empecé, yo decía California Civil Code. Yo pensé que ese era el California Civil Code porque era un caso civil y yo decía, conforme al, 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 al Código Civil de California, eh, tan, ¿no? Entonces yo según yo estaba haciendo lo correcto, pero estaba equivocado porque era California Compensation Cases. Bueno, entonces eh, se supone que cuando leemos una traducción a la vista tenemos que hacerlo de esa manera. Si es una traducción, definitivamente tenemos que colocarlo así como lo ven abajo, ¿no? Volumen 48 de, 
California Compensation, la traducción de eso, ¿no? Ok, bueno, les ruego disculpas, ¿no? Eh, porque me demoré, mira, aquí eh, ustedes en esta traducción van a ver muchos de los términos que vimos durante esta presentación, los van a ver en acción. Recuerden que les voy a dar también la hoja y un glosario de términos que cubrimos durante la presentación. Mm, de, les repito, no, estos términos no solamente son que yo los, me los inventé, son, es decir, yo tengo profesores en, en mi escuela que también dan cursos de esto, concuerdan en mucha terminología conmigo, especialmente porque es de México, ¿no? Entonces, pero aquí la tarea de ustedes es saber a quién le están interpretando para ver quién es su auditorio, ¿verdad? Y uh, lo, lo que lo, what we call localization. But anyways, as long as you understand the concept, this is one of the forms that I believe out of all the forms, there's, there's more to these forms, by the way. There's addendums and they're very complicated, which is free. one of them is uh, the Medicare set aside. That is a nightmare. Maybe uh, Mark will invite me on another day to read that one. But uh, the uh, Medicare set aside is a nightmare. That's an addendum that can be added to this. And that is national, by the way. All of you have to do that. No, it doesn't matter. What's... Yes. Yes, because it's, it's federal. It's Medicare. This is this is, you know, this is state. But for for the addendums with Medicare, everybody has to do those. So good luck. Thank you, everybody. I'll, I'll take questions right now. Okay, thank you. I'm going to pull out a couple of questions from the chat. Um, Lisa Beth is asking what the title was of the glossary you showed earlier. And is okay, that something so, that you can uh, email me and I can email out to everybody? Yeah, that's what I'll do. Um, what I'll do right now is let me show you the glossary that, um, give me a second here and I'll show you what, I haven't even given it a name because, uh, let me see. Uh, give me one second here. Mm, okay, give me one second. And then I will get this and I will show you what it is that I want to show you. Oh, I can't seem to. Uh... Oh, there it is. So what I did was I got every word that we covered. OK, like, for example, here, claims administrator. Uh, I put here claims adjuster. I didn't put the definition, but, you know, an evaluador de reclamos, evaluador de siniestros. So every word that that I. I, I knew that everybody was going to want some type of glossary. Uh, but see, like adenda, right? And I gave, so all of this, all of these words you will receive, okay? And I even did a little a little translation here of the, uh, so you can have it because you're, eh, los notarios, no? Um, eso de los notarios, that's another, I can actually give a whole class on notary publics because it's it's a mess. Uh, you know, how do you translate notary public? Especially not from English to Spanish, no problem. From Spanish to English, you got to be careful, all right? So just, just one thing before I leave, civil law notary. Remember that, civil law notary. If you look up the word civil law notary, that is the precise equivalent of the notaries in Latin America. Civil Law, nor and in most countries, by the way, because remember, we have Napoleon law, we have English law. Most countries follow Napoleon law. Most, not all, but most. And they're, they're, you know, when Napoleon law, you have these attorneys are usually notaries, right? So what's the equivalent in English of those uh, attorneys in, in, in Latin American countries is civil law notary. So that's the solution. Now, it's okay to use, well, not okay, but from English to Spanish, it's a little bit easier because the the uh, the um, the uh, notaries here do some of the functions that the, the that the notaries do in Latin America, for example, like they do authenticate signatures. So they are partial, but not but saying notary in, in Spanish is not really a, a very precise translation because it, it ba basically it's a signature a person that authenticates signatures that's what it is that's what we have here in the US right but so it's uh it's it's it, there's other terms but from spanish into english that's the term that i always recommend uh yeah but you'll have copies of all of this that's that's the answer i'm sorry marco no no that's great yeah i, I put a comment about notary in the chat myself mm -hmm. very good yeah that's it's 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 it's, it, can, it can be a mess. Okay, okay, what other questions do you have? 
Um, lots of questions about glossaries. Those will be emailed out probably Monday. I'll put together an email once the recording is, is uploaded and I'll send you the link to that too. Thank you. Um, sure. Has, any, has anybody ran into something similar to this? Just out of curiosity? To this kind of form? Not yet, but terminology. That's mainly the form, you know, they, they, they change. They can change, but uh, depending on the state. Uh, but the uh, terminology should be very comparable. I haven't done workers' comp hearings now. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It, I'm sure that you, it, they'll come up. They'll come up. Let's see. Well, else? Nobody else here? Okay. Let's see. Any other question? So, hey, Nora, hi, um, this is Nora De Palma, Edgar, um, and Marco and everybody. Um, so I've heard of, oh, there you go. I see it in the comment, Fede, Fedetario, yeah, for a uh, public notary. Okay, well, yes, I didn't read. Yeah. The, is that? Yeah. Fe, lo, el, sí, lo que pasa es que Fedetario, fedetario. that's, okay, are you going from English to Spanish or Spanish to English? Ha, ha. Let's, let's. From Spanish to English. Okay, if you're going to, uh, the problem is, okay, Fedatario from- I'm sorry, any, from English to Spanish. Okay. El que da fe. The, the problem is el Fedatario in, in, in Latin American countries is still a lawyer. And that's the problem. A notary here is not maybe a lawyer. I mean, I mean, he or she may be a lawyer, but normally it, they're not. They're just, you know, I can- go and do a weekend course or one eight hour course. I don't know how many hours it is now, but you, you take and you're a notary. You're I, not. Yeah. I'm a, so, I'm a notary. I have zero hours of training. I just filled out a form. Well, there you go. So then the problem is if you say, el es un fedatario, they're still going to think, Oh, he's an attorney. See, that's the problem. And that's why you can't from English to Spanish. You can, I mean, that's why I'm saying notario. If you say notario, you have to make a comment. Because he, he is un notario in that in that sense, but you got to be be very careful. As a matter of fact, in I believe it's in Texas, uh, the, the you know the, the you know those places where they do all kinds of immigration help and notary work, they're prohibited from using the word notario. It's against the law because yeah. a lot of people from Latin America, oh you know notario, look, let's go let's go let's go ask him what we should do in our case. But no, he's not. So it's illegal to put notario. That's why you got to be very careful. You got to make a note on your translation. I'm using the word notario loosely because, uh, it, or, or in Spanish, you have to, if you're going from English to Spanish, se usa la palabra notario, pero you have to put some kind of note that, that you're talking about uh, an uh, authenticate, uh, authenticating official or something like that. As a matter, yeah, something like that, you know, authenticating official or... Because you got to be careful. In certain Latin American countries, as far as I know, I think, for example, Argentina, Fedatario, si no estoy mal, es un, es una, es un abogado. Es un abogado. Entonces, por eso, you got to be careful. You got to make some note or, or you got to come up with a term that says es una, a una persona que autentica firmas. That's what he is or she is. But for, now, from Spanish to English, it's easy. If you look up all of you, I want you to Google civil law notary. It gives you the exact definition of what a Latin American notary is. So that's no problem. It's from English to Spanish that it's a problem. It's a problem because uh, we they, people don't understand that concept. It's very typical to the U.S. Bueno, ¿cómo, cómo así? ¿Autentica firma? Pues un notario, ¿no? No, no, sí, pero no, no puede hacer las otras funciones. Solamente eso. Uh -huh. So, you know, yeah, so it's, it's basically, es una persona que autentica firmas. Que... Uh, es una de las funciones del notario, pero les digo, se puede decir notario, pero con un uh, uh, translator's note. Or use some other type, type of term. Okay, what is the other question? Those are all the questions I see in the chat. Están calladitos, güey. It's, it, uh, I don't know if many of you would agree that it is kind of complicated. I mean, there is some complexity to this. Uh, because, um, but, but you know what, once you have the main terms down, uh, no matter what state you're in, you're good. 
uh, even that uh, Medicare set aside, which I'm going to show you actually a, a picture of it um, really quick. Like we get another question. Um, uh, uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Just to, just to let you know, let me see if I can find a, uh, yeah, here it is. Uh, just so you all know, let me see, where are we? Okay. So here's an actual, uh, this is a real document. I signed it. I, I did that. You read it. Sometimes I read them over the phone. Sometimes I read them in person, whatever. So, so if you go down, let me shoot. Let me go a little bit. Oh, shoot. I don't know why it's okay. Let me go use this. Okay. This is what I mean by Medicare set aside. Okay. So basically these are addendums. These are the additional pages that you can get in a settlement with workers' compensation. And basically they can be, you know, five, six pages of paragraphs and paragraphs of information. And like I said, Medicare is a national thing. So, you know, uh, they talk about secondary payers. They talk about uh, the, the Medicare set aside. And, you know, you first you got to understand all those concepts or else it's going to be very difficult to interpret. This is some things that you, they don't teach you in interpreting school. I had never done it. I had a bachelor's and never done any of this because it's very specific to a certain branch of, um, of legal interpreting. So uh, but again, this is what you you run into the most when you go out there in the field. But we don't have time to get into this, but this is, it deals with Medicare. And like I said, Medicare is a national thing. And you might have run into this. Sooner or later, you will run into one of these crazy documents and you have to read, you don't, you don't get to take it home to translate it. As a matter of fact, they don't have these forms translated. They should, but they don't. And there's reasons for that. But these addendums are very specific to each person. So no matter you know how much you may study one of these, you're going to get a slightly different one. But if you understand the main concepts, you should be okay. Okay. So this is just an example of one of these Medicare set asides. You might see it there on your on your screen. Okay. So that will be for another class. But just just a heads up. Okay. Any other question? If not, then I think we can call this a day. And and you know, I was I'm very happy that I was able to come and share some. I hope you guys liked it. Uh, I'm sorry yeah. I had to run. <laughs> I've put your um, website in the chat if you all want to see some more of the training that Edgar has on through trans interpreting. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you. Lots of content for medical and legal interpreters. Yeah. Yeah. The classes are intense. We have to see We see a lot of, of content. This is an I, I, I'm sorry. Like, again, I, I rush through a whole. Usually you should take a little bit more time, but, you know, I try to put as much content as I could in this hour. And uh, yeah, and I hope you do like it. We have a class that's, it, it goes through all these concepts a little bit slower. Um, there's several classes. This is, you know, at least in California, it's, it's a big market. Um, that's why, but again, we maybe if we come to another show, we'll, we'll deal with something else. We'll deal with something else. All right. Thank you. And just for any of you who are here in my area, Austin, Texas, on Thursday night, we're having an interpreter meetup at Papacitos on North 35 at six o'clock. You can contact me for uh, more details. I uh, would love to have you come out and meet in person. The pandemic wow. is is virtually over and we're going to celebrate like it's 2019. <laughs> you, incredible. It's you, would you would you believe it virtually over? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I mean, I know it's not completely, but we're getting there. Martha, question? Or are you just waving? Just a quick question. I was wondering, after translating these overwhelming forms to a Spanish speaker person that does not have a lot of education, what type of response do you receive? Okay, that's a great question. And uh, this is one that I want to, when we get together with a lot of colleagues, I would like to debate. So we have this thing that we have to keep the register. 
And that's one of the things, you know, we don't add, omit, paraphrase, all that, but we got to keep the register. So within that, that concept of keeping the register, I think there's a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, like I said, lean, for example, right? A lean, gravamen. But, you know, a lot of people say, what the heck is that, you know? Uh, what's a, what's a gravamen? And the, and if the attorney is there, you know we can we can use gravamen. And if they look at you, they you 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 know you can indicate if you have any question about a word or something. I say ask the attorney, right? And then the the, the attorney would say, well, a lien is this, this, and that. And that's but some many times we're alone with a form, and we know this. So my my thing is always, for example, another term would be DMV. For example, the 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 equivalent of DMV in any Latin American country would be Secretaría de Tránsito. In Mexico, in Colombia, it's una Secretaría de Tránsito, or, 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 or Ministerios, or lo que sea. Pero Secretaría de Tránsito is a term that we use in Colombia, that they use in Mexico. That's the equivalent of the DMV. But if you t tell somebody that here that's been living here for a few years, that they speak their Spanglish, right? They're LEPs. And you tell them Secretaría de Tránsito, they're going to say, what's that? Oh, el DMV. Oh, okay. Okay. El DMV si lo entiende. O el Departamento de Motores y Vehículos también lo entienden. So, what is, what are, what are we, what are we going to do? We're using, the, if we use the correct register, it would be Secretaría de Tránsito. But if we wiggle it a little bit, Departamento de, de, de Motores y Vehículos is not completely incorrect or wrong. And it's not like you're going off, off the, uh, of the registers, no? no se están saliendo de la escala del Richter. So then you're, and the same goes with lien, el gravamen o cuentas por pagar, que son lo, las cuentas que se deben pagar. O, o, for example, the other word that I told you was, uh, let me see if I can remember, because I have all these words in my head. Uh, not lean, lean, and I can't remember the other word. But there's another word that I, I mentioned. Yeah. Uh, you know, that is that, uh, eh, como se dice, la, como AOE or COE. All right. uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's muy fácil. And it, look, this is my job as an interpreter is to convey a message to keep the register, but nobody tells me there's, there's a lot, there are a lot of ways to say a word, uh, a certain word. And what my idea is so like, uh, uh, let me give you an example. It's typical burglary okay now and when i studied they taught me a word because when you are interpreting for example in simultaneous and you the one of the one of the best words to use for us for our convenience is escalamiento that that word is in is, is really if you tell any latin american me, me comet, cometió el delito de escalamiento they're going to look at you like what are you talking about guy that, that's not, you know, so, and, and actually that word is, there's, for example, in Mexico, uh, 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 they use allanamiento de morada con fines de robo, or, or anything similar thereof. So that means they went, porque allanamiento de morada is breaking and entering, which doesn't mean that you, you, that you were, had the intention to steal. Maybe you wanted, uh, I don't know, it, maybe it's a famous actor and you just wanted to go in there to to you know, look at the actor or whatever. So you did breaking an entry without the intention to steal. But burglary is going in, inside a home with the intention of stealing. So it's allanamiento de morada, pero con fines de robo. And anything that's similar is okay. Now that for a, for a normal lay person is more, you can understand that. Entró a robar con la intención de robar. That's burglary. So escalamiento is... is was now we don't use that word anymore, but it, it's it's still you know it's very handy for when you do a simultaneous because you use less words, but still it's not a word. Está en desuso. Es un término muy antiguo que aparece en códigos muy antiguos porque antes para entrar a robar they would use a ladder and they would go y escalaban y se metían. They would burglarize the home, right? So when I'm, I'm giving you examples of terms, so these oh, like I gave you DMV, you can use. Secretaría de Tránsito. So we have a wide spectrum of words. And, and my, my concept now, the problem is that we as interpreters have to have a good vocabulary for this because we learn one term, the correct term, and that's the word, word I'm going to use. But then we have to think about our clients as well. So uh, the richer our vocabulary, okay, the, the better we're going we're gonna, to uh, help the LEP provide the service. So so you got to be flexible with the terminology, remembering to keep register. OK, 
Okay, yes, I know we're not we're not going to add, no, but we. I can use this word and they can understand better. Becky, use now. There comes there comes a time when you use a term that that's the only term you know. That's the only, and then you have no option. Okay, but and most of the times, um, most of the times, Martha, they're always no matter how much you do this, they're still going to come out like not knowing what the heck you said, because that's how the English speakers are. The English speakers, what I I can't understand. Any, I've 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 been there. They're listening to the judge and they say, I don't understand a word you're saying, judge. Can you dumb it down for me a little bit? And then the judge has to do that. He has to lower the register. And that's that's the way the cookie crumbles. There's certain times that you have no option or, or you're, limit, uh, you're limited on the, the type of vocabulary that you know or that you can use. And that's it. But, but when you can, please, you know, take into consideration what I just told you. So there's that, that thing, that register. There, there is some flexibility to that. Okay, what other question do you have? Thank you, gracias. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very practical advice. Yeah, I, I would probably get lynched by some certain interpreter, but that's okay. I, I think we, we deserve a, a healthy conversation on, you know, a lot of things have to be revisited in the profession. You know, you know a lot of ethical ish uh, uh, books have been written uh, since 2004, 2002. We're talking about Things are 10, 12 years old. If they're five years old, they're already old. And certain things haven't been revised. And, uh, you know, now that we, we're in the, uh, in this era where now we do a lot of remote, there's a lot of ethical issues that have not been, uh, they're not revised, they're not in the books. So we're getting away with murder right now. And it's okay because we don't really know what's going on. And we have, I mean, there's lone wolves that are giving some training here, there. You know, we're trying to, to do say something, but, we got to put it in writing in the, uh, fortunately, I'm not a member of my, my time is limited. I'm not a member of these organizations, but that's one little thing that, that can, and I'm sure that they're working on that as we speak uh, on revising a lot of these things. And um, well, that's why it's important to participate in these uh, associations and things of that sort to, to change certain aspects that need to be changed in the profession. Yeah. And it's important to just develop our own sense of judgment based on our experience and our, our goal of trying to communicate as clearly as we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I've got to wrap things up now, um, but I want to give Edgar a, a warm applause and thank you for this interesting and useful and very practical presentation.